I just wanted to take a moment to remind everyone that the My Comic Shop Country Kickstarter campaign is currently underway. If you've been enjoying these podcasts, this is what it's all been leading toward, a new documentary movie exploring comic book stores across America. Any amount you're able to give is greatly appreciated, and there are some great rewards to choose from. Thank you to everyone who has already pledged, and if you haven't pledged yet, don't be a flat squirrel. Welcome to My Comic Shop History. I am your host, Anthony Desiato. This week, my journey to comic shops across America brings me to the comic book shop in Wilmington, Delaware. I'm joined by the store's owners, the husband and wife team of Sarah and Patrick Titus. Hello. Hello. Welcome to the show. Thanks. So, you know, one of my goals as I am, uh, you know, going to various stores is to kind of find and um, represent a cross section of stores. Sure. And, you know, that takes a number of forms. Um, so I've had some stores that have been around for a long time, long standing establishments, and then other stores that are, you know, really just within their first year or so. What's interesting to me about your store is that um, you kind of walk the line because, I, as I understand it, the store has been around for over 20 years, mm-hmm. but uh, you guys took it over from the previous ownership within the the past few years? Right. Yeah. Uh, the shop uh, opened originally in 1989, and we are now the third owners. Um, we have had it for about seven years, and uh, Titus worked for about 10 years prior to that. So he's got a lot of the um, long standing history with the customers and with uh, the type of questions that we get in our particular uh, area. And then by virtue of being able to buy the shop and become owners, we've now been able to take it kind of into that new um, place that we would like to be to shop that's more welcoming and friendly and, and bigger and brighter and looking forward. So that's where we are now. Gotcha. Yeah, it's. I mean, it's interesting to me because you have, you know, I was able to spend some time exploring the shop before we sat down to record. And I was, I was very impressed. And you know, you have the inventory of a store that's been around for a long time, <laughs> but, you know, you have this, you know, fresh blood and new perspective yeah. behind the counter. So it's, mm-hmm. it's again, that, that really potent mix that a lot of stores don't have. It's tough. Um, there definitely are a lot of different types of uh, interests and different types of people with different interests. And uh, that is, I think, why we are um, are still here, is that the shop has always had vintage toys and old comics, and expensive key issue comics, and the gaming side, and back issues. So it's always had a very broad reach. Um, the ability to help people that are looking for different things, or the really, you know, the the bin diggers that are looking for the weird, crazy old stuff that no one's ever heard of, um, versus the kids that come in brand new. Um, that's definitely the handling of the customers is is of equally as important as to what you have. Um, and I think because we're we're a couple and we have different backgrounds, um, that's a success for us. I'm comfortable talking. I'm a I'm a front of the house uh, retail person. That's uh, you know this is this is what I do. I can I can sell you cheese. I can sell you coffee. I can sell you whatever because they all have similar interests. Um, Titus and some of our other folks. I, I, I am more of a the back caves kind of guy. I'd rather just be pricing and sorting and and doing that sort of thing. Um, Which is what we need. Yeah, we need um, that too. We need a little bit of everything. Yeah, we both have skills that cross over, but complement each other pretty well. Yeah, I couldn't sell the stuff if it wasn't here to have. So uh, that balances us out. And, and we also understand that we're in Delaware. We're not in a big city. We're not in Philly. <laughs> we're not in New York. So we kind of need to be a, a, a destination somewhere where you can go and kind of like plan your day around. We're right off 95. So it's easy for you to kind of stop by if you're, if you're driving somewhere. Yeah, we're, um, we're a good pit stop on your way to Philly or Baltimore. Exactly. Um, you'll be near us. but uh, So we try to make it a, a fun place where there's, there's something for everyone. Actually, on that note, if you wouldn't mind telling me a little bit about the area. So, I mean, I drove through just a little bit, and it seems very residential, very suburban. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. We're uh, a mile off of I-95, uh, so very convenient. And we're just a few minutes over the border from Pennsylvania. 
about 15 minutes from New Jersey. So we do get a lot of pass through. Um, North Wilmington, uh, where we are in the state, is a lot of schools, a lot of families, a lot of businesses. Um, we get a ton of people from downtown Wilmington that come on their lunch break. Um, so that's a whole other um, you know, type of reader and what they have their interests, um, as well as the colleges. Um, lots of elementary schools, tons of kids. We have tons of teachers and educators and guidance counselors that are our regular pull box customers. And even as somebody walks through and says, oh, I'm taking this to, you know, this um, community program, um, whenever we find somebody like that, we like to give them whatever bonus posters or books or promo materials that we have because then we can reach so many more people by sending it out into the world with people that have come to us. Um, I said before uh, off air that because we're here doing this all the time, we don't always have time to get out into the world. So um, we're grateful for other folks that are willing to take that uh, evangelism mm -hmm. and go out there and spread the word of comics. Yeah, I mean, as far as the whole educational aspect, I always love hearing stuff like that because mm -hmm. growing up, I, I mean, I, I did not have that in my school experience, but I always love hearing about that. And actually, one of the mm -hmm. customers at the store where I used to work, uh, he's a high school English teacher, and he mm -hmm. has a whole you know graphic novel section in his classroom, and uh, kids love it. Yeah. So it's That's always right. great to yeah. hear that and that you're able to get involved with the schools around here. That's something that definitely has grown over the past few years. Uh, when we took over... We had the uh, excitement and the and the urgency to go out into schools and programmings and libraries and said, hey, we're here. What can we do? How can we help? What free stuff can we throw at you? And we didn't really get a lot of response. Um, that's something that I would definitely uh, keep in mind for folks that are opening up a new shop or taking over a shop that what works for somebody else may well not work for you because you've got different people with different needs coming to your place. So it also takes a long time to build that community. Well, you know, you, you, you get a club here and you kind of build, you know, bring some people in and get like a kids club and you start doing like a teen time kind of club and starting a book club for the, you know, the adults and it kind of all kind of snowballs into like this great little community and it's, it's pretty great. I love it. Definitely the word of mouth, people bringing in their friends. Um, so we had tried to get into the community. We had tried to do some stuff based on other shops success and it didn't work for us. So that's when we figured that we would build our own events and we started to say, Hey, within our newsletter base, within our foot traffic in the store, what do you want us to do? What would you come to? And that's how we started the snowball of chain of events of getting the 17 clubs we do now. Um, so I think a little bit of that is that we're, word got around that we were new owners and that we were the exact opposite of the traditional kind of old school comic owner. Um, we don't overcharge people just for fun. Uh, so that's a thing. But um and again, with the past several years of comics being successful and the movies and the, and the really good comics that are out, now people are coming to us saying, we're having a, a comic convention at our elementary school. And then if one elementary school does it, the one down the street does it and somebody else does it. So there's a lot of active interest and it cracks me up how many kids and parents are super into it now. So <laughs> it's a good time to be in comics. That's terrific. You know, it's really funny. I, I, this theme has has emerged uh, over the course of these recordings. You guys are now the third husband and wife team awesome. I, I've encountered on my travels. Really? And awesome. I love it. I think that's terrific. You know, it's it's great to see that. And I, I guess I'm, a, you know, it, it's a little surprising almost. I, I wasn't mm -hmm. expecting it going in, but it's been great to find. I would like to talk with those people and find out what their conditions of, of having a business together is. I know that some places have a husband and wife team, but usually um, they're not as equally shared. Like sometimes the one partner still has a full-time job or a part-time job outside of the shop. And that is not the case here. Well, we also met working a warehouse job together. So we, we had a good working chemistry as well as, you know, a, re a relationship chemistry. So, um, so it this, works out really well. So is this before you were working at the previous version of the comic book shop? Mm -hmm. Well, this is, yeah. This yeah. Is, yeah. Right. When we met, we actually, we were working for Amazon.com. Oh, yeah. Uh, which actually uh, taught us a lot about what uh, we could and should expect from Diamond and how they package <laughs> things. And um, it's great to be, you know, we were a part of that when it was young and new and very small and, and positive and got out when it got a little less so. Um, but yeah, we established that we we see the same things in, in importance and we can communicate well on the job. And um, yeah, it's it's pretty good. There's a lot of yelling involved, but it's not angry yelling, usually. No. It's just it's just shouting. Yeah, just long days. 
takes a lot of passion. Yeah, yeah. sure. Uh, now, t- so I, I guess I'll call you Titus. That's what sure. you said. Yeah. Yep. Even you call him Titus, which is... I do. I do. <laughs> and that all goes back to warehouse work and, and all that, so... That works. Yeah. Um, so now, Titus, as I understand correctly from my, my research, you were the comic book fan coming into this? I mean, we, we were both fans. I, I, I was more of the collector. I was the comic book collector. I was a toy collector. I've been doing this since high school, so since 96, 95, to some extent, you know, buying and selling at, you know, flea markets, that sort of thing, um, pre-eBay days, you know, so um, I've been doing this a long time, to some extent, yeah. I did grow up reading comics and collecting things and being in nerd culture as well, but it wasn't as prominent and it wasn't as mainstream. I was asking some of our nerds here today some question about Magneto and Wolverine and they're like, where were you in the 90s? And I said, I was reading Optic Nerve and Peep Show in the 90s. I was not reading <laughs> X-Men and Fantastic Four. So again, that has, uh, you know, the different approach to people. The long time people that know their first fights and costumes and stuff. It's great that I don't feel like I have to know all of that stuff because I can turn around and literally anybody else can answer it or I can Google. Yeah. Um, but I have more of the eccentric, super independent off the wall stuff that is more approachable for somebody that isn't really into quote unquote comics, but more like graphic novel and and um, more college age people that are coming in that like weird, cool stuff. So um, I'm definitely a, an off the wall people and some folks have to realize that when I recommend something, it may not be for them, it's for me. So if you like my weirdness, be aware. All right. Yeah, we definitely have like a, the, a point where our tastes you know kind of converge but mm-hmm. we we also have our own you know separate little little uh, areas too that we kind of excel at so yeah that's, that's good yeah. yeah yeah i'm sure that creates a nice balance for definitely for you guys and for customers yeah um, but i bring it up because I, I think the article uh sarah you mentioned how you know coming into this you didn't know if that would be a disadvantage not having mm-hmm. that that long yeah, history terrifying and but that you found that not having that baggage ended up helping you because you could point out books that were new reader friendly because if, yes. if they were friendly for you <laughs> then right it could be for others who didn't have the background as well yes and now i'm losing that um that distance and i'm starting to get event fatigue and just it's I, I'm turning into it and I'm seeing myself change. Um, but yeah, that's definitely an important part. And that's also why we bring in, uh, you know, students that are maybe they're only here for a couple of years part time before they go on to college. But because they're still on a, a fresher, newer place, they can there's still somebody around that can have that um, that freshness. Yeah. When I read that, I, I couldn't help but think of. You know, I got into comics in the early 90s with the death of Superman. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I I mean, I talked to a lot of people at the comic shop where I worked and for the podcast and all that. And I feel like earlier on in my reading career, I was talking to people who had been reading comics since the 50s or 60s. And Mm -hmm. I felt like, oh, they have so much more credibility than I do. I just came in in the 90s. But I've spoken to people who got into comics with, you know, Batman Hush or Civil War. And it's like, you know, no origin story is any more or less valid. You know, we're all coming at it at different times and with Mm -hmm. different stories. But, you know, it's that passion that's there. And sooner or later, it doesn't take long before you feel like a veteran of these things. (laughs) Yeah, we've had kids at our kids clubs that just blow some of the adults out of the water with their knowledge. Like they're like these like six year old, seven year old kids that have just like digested all of Wikipedia and just know all the everythings and can go off on like. You know, Miss Marvel and like, you know, Carol Core stuff. And But what's funny about that is when you have kids, our first kids club almost almost was in a fist fight <laughs> because we were getting them introduced to superheroes and, and we were going through like, what's their, what's their secret uh, identity name? What's their power set? What's their origin? And we said, what's Logan? What's, what's Wolverine's real name? And I, I, I think I see where this is going. Little yeah. girl said Little girl said James, little boy said Logan, and they were screaming at each other. And I had to explain to them how there's multiple continuities and how depending on what you may have read at this point, you would be correct. But there's more information over here that also makes you correct. And that's okay. Now, shifting a little bit to the the comic shop history aspect of this, uh, Titus, I kind of want to turn to you and, and your experience working uh, under previous ownership. What was that experience like? What did you observe there? Uh, that you wanted to try to either emulate or do differently uh, under your the, like regime, <laughs> under, yeah. under your tenure. Well, the, the previous owners were, it was very typical, classic kind of comic shop mentality that kind of taught me all the things that I don't want to be. <laughs> so it kind of pushed us in a much more positive direction. More more about the community, more about having this be like a, a place people could, you know, hang out at and not just like buy your stuff and leave, but I want a place where, you know, people feel comfortable. 
the previous owners were just very like sell the stuff be done with it I mean, I was only here for the, the one set of owners. I, I kind of but you're talking the, about the previous owners, like there was two of them. It's really yeah, just yeah. the one owner and his son was the manager. Yeah, and before it's, them, it's it was one owners. owner. Okay, who was a typical sort it, of it guy, was, but before our it was time. like a, it was like a '90s shop. It was like a lot of people like kind of came up in the '90s boom with the death of Superman and all that stuff. And then once that collapsed, a lot of them didn't really know how to adjust because it wasn't just like easy money. You had to actually you know read the comics and promote good stuff and get people excited for things and a lot of a lot of the older generation of, of comic owners don't want to do all that work and don't really want to build the community like like we wanted to. So that, that was kind of our first, you know, thing that we really wanted to do was like kind of get back to like basics and actually build this as a community and a place where people can, you know, want to go to and hang out and not just like buy stuff and leave. Like I kind of, I really hate that attitude. Well, uh, if I can, that's actually a really funny thing that I had to learn coming into the shop um, from a very food service customer forward uh culture that sure there are new people that have um kind of more of like a um <clears throat> how do i say that delicately more uh social uh activity uh more involved with other people and they want that communication they want someone to talk with them and hang out and show them stuff but there also are plenty of people that want you to leave them the heck alone and don't engage them. And I've I've had a couple customers that are like, just, just stop talking to me. <laughs> and once I stopped talking to them and I just let them do their thing, eventually they would warm up to me. And now we've gotten to having conversation level. But um, there are so there are still people that want to be left alone, that want to just do their thing and not have, you know, have to interact with you. But um, I think I think a lot of the 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 difference between a 90s comic shop and a 2000s comic shop is the motivation for getting into comics in the 90s was very um, popularity kind of bubble based. And so it's people seeing it was about shiny covers easy cash and, and yeah. sure, but like Titus Investing was saying, in, in nonsense. Yeah. when that ends, you have to be able to uh, to adjust for that. And the people that were shopping in comic shops in the 90s that saw that behavior then said, hey, I want to do this, but better. And now you're seeing a, a different version of people. It's like the generational change. It's it's pretty neat. It's pretty cool. Yeah, I've definitely observed that so far in, in the stores that I've been to where, you know, among the newer stores and or the, you know, the younger owners, you're definitely seeing more of a social media presence, more mm -hmm. events, more of an effort for inclusion and to bring mm -hmm. all different kinds of people into the store. Uh, just, again, more of that, proactive community building mm -hmm. uh, is definitely something that I've seen at, and, at and trying stores. trying to promote more of the reading aspect than the collecting aspect and there's nothing wrong with collecting but if you're if you're not if you're buying it and not enjoying it or buying it just to collect and you're not reading it like I kind of want to push more people more towards the just read it and enjoy it there's plenty of stuff you can get excited about you know now um, there are some long-term comic shop owners that have been around for decades and decades that are adapting and they are doing well. So um, age and 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 length of time are not the only factors, sure. but they seem to be some pretty clear ones that that show. But um, there are a lot of veteran comic shop owners that have been through so many changes and bubbles and seeing the and and, and they've still survived because they've adapted. So it's really cool to see. Um, the people that have already weathered this and seeing what they've learned and they're very willing to share with anybody who wants to do better. Um, so that's a very encouraging thing too, to see that, you know, in another 30 years, we can be, be those people too. Now, when you made the decision to, to buy the store and take over, what sort of decision making process was that? Like, was it an easy, like, yep, we're doing this. Was it more, more deliberation involved? I mean, I've been kind of, I want to say we were kind of building up to that. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, it was it was clear that the that the old owners kind of wanted out, so it was either you know kind of buy the store or get another job, <laughs> um, one or the other. <laughs> so, um, and I've been doing this so long, I was kind of already doing all that work anyway. I was doing all the you know the ordering, I was doing all the you know most of the sorting and the pricing and all that kind of stuff. So it w wasn't a, a big switch for me to go from you know manager to um, to owner. And I mean, I, I've, I've been doing this so much, you know, it was such a huge part of my life. I mean, I don't mind doing it the rest of my life. So, you know, yeah. yeah, I had a pretty decent job. I was pretty happy where I was. 
It was long hours. Yeah, your hours it was really were really rough. Can you but say I what you were it. doing? Or? I was. I was a cheesemonger. Um, I did. I sold cheese and uh, and delicious sausages. It was a, in oh. Tallulah's Table. It's a, a gourmet market in Kennett Square. So it was, it was a commute. It was like 10 in the morning to 2 in the morning. Um, but it was delicious, fresh food. And I could I could call the farmer and hear the lambs that they were going to bring over later that day. And it was great. Um, but then we're presented with the choice of, do you want to own your own comic shop? And that was really like, I'm I'm not going to not take the chance to own my own comic shop. If it fails and goes horribly, at least to own my own comic shop for a little bit. I mean, I feel like the long-term goal for us was to own a business together at some point. Right. Be it a some, team. some kind of food industry sort of thing or a collectibles sort of thing like we're doing now. So. And his came up first. Yeah. So there you go. Yeah. But it does. it is all similar, though. Before I sold cheese, I sold coffee. And you have the nuances that go with the different flavor profiles. And with cheese, you have them age different ways or with different milks and from different regions. And you have to ask the same questions with those as you do with comics, which is you're trying to get somebody to tell you what they want when they don't know what it is that they want. So you ask them questions like, what is it that you like about Deadpool? Why do you find him like what does it, um, or, or what what type of story do you like? Maybe you don't know about comics, but you know about literature or movies. Tell me the themes TV and the shows, genres, yeah. and then we can find things and put them in your hands. But you're not going to know. I want to read a crime genre of comics. Yeah. People don't know that that's a thing. So give us the broad strokes, and we'll find you the details. Yeah. When you guys took over, um, did you find that a lot of the customers stayed with you? Yeah, oh, definitely. Yeah. Um, some came and back. A lot came back too. <laughs> <Not> that. <laughs> um, there now there are a few customers that have left, and we're kind of okay with that. Um, we have a, a pretty strict, like, don't be a jerk policy. Uh, that's what we teach all of our clubs. That's what you know. And I find it interesting when I hear people saying how they were treated in shops, either by the staff or by the customers, or the sort of things that go on in other places and other. Um, parts of the country that we just don't experience that sort of attitude and I don't know if it's my overbearing in your face (laughs) hey this is a real friendly shop and you're going to be polite here like it's we don't there's no reason to make fun of anybody for anything everybody knows something different everyone's starting at a different point and every once in a while you'll get a kid or a grown-up that'll say something kind of And we're like, hey, man. And we just drew, we just kind of gently be like, hey, that's not cool. Come on. let's." And, and that usually gets them to, to rethink about it. Or um, a big thing is uh, people talking over each other, whether it's kids and kids or parents or, um, you know, just partners or whatever. I just say, hey, I was asking them. Let them, let them speak for themselves. It's really important that we – it's important for me to encourage people that they can – talk for themselves and and get their own opinions across and i find a lot of times with parents and kids the kids will have a different answer than what the parents do because you don't you think you know you don't know what they've experienced you know so um That that is one of the things that you're really good at is uh dealing with kids and dealing with hey thanks you know like the the families because i mean a lot of a lot of people that work in shops have a hard time with kids they don't know how to deal with the little like bratty types or the little yelling screaming kids but sarah's sarah's great at that props um, to my mom for being yeah. a preschool teacher um <laughs> even yesterday we were doing a, a like a D club for kids and a couple of them were getting a little distracted and chatty so i gave them paper to draw their characters and they're like wow something to do like you just have to think yeah. about you can't be mad at a kid because they're being a kid figure out what why are they doing that and go give them something else to do but uh, my, my parents raised us, my mom and my dad both, of being, you know, talk for yourself, be, be you know, assertive if you need to be, and um, letting kids know and letting the parents know, too, that it's okay if they don't answer right away. It's okay if they want to take some time and look at stuff. Yeah, be nice to it. Try not to bang it up too much while you're here, but you're supposed to look at the things. It's okay. Like, and... And I think there are, are not enough places that do that, that just by saying, hey, it's okay if your kid takes a couple extra seconds to answer, that the more we can provide that space, the more it helps people realize that that space is important. And hopefully they bring that along with themselves into you know wherever else they can take it. Um, so we definitely uh, have an a alternate um, 
social agenda of making people be considerate and and aware and just be nice, man. Come on, just be nice. I mean, those are skills that people should be cultivating, <laughs> you know, in general. So it's good that, you know, if they're getting that here and then they're behaving properly within the walls of the comic book shop and that they take that beyond the walls of the comic right. shop. That's yeah. great. Everybody and, and, wins. And that kind of goes back to that old school mentality of, of comic shops. It's very like hands off, you know, like don't mm -hmm. touch that. Don't look at that. You're not allowed to read that while you're here sort of thing. And I'm like, that. no, that's that's stupid. Like look through it, you know, see if you like it, see if you enjoy it and I, talk to us. We don't you know? have kids. Uh, we have cats and that is more than enough for me to have to handle. <laughs> thank you. But um, but kids are great. So it's it's like the grownups get a little bit of time off because they don't have to worry about their kids because someone's taking care of them and I get to not have to talk to adults for a while and just be on a kid level and see what they see and that re like re-energizes me because it's it's like a it's like a break you know and then it's also giving them they can just go for 10 minutes and wander around on their own and their kids gonna play with the Legos and it's gonna be fine um, but as I said before there's a couple of folks that they don't play nice or they have a problem and I'm I did get an attitude with you sir because you had an attitude with me and my customers so maybe it's best if you just don't come back here I don't like to do it uh, yeah I was I gonna will. ask if you, it, if you it have doesn't had to ban does, anybody or it doesn't happen very often but no it, it no but I'm not gonna let that like infect anything else that's going on and and when I have had to to lay down the law people appreciate that and they say you know that guy had been had been kind of freaking me out too, and I really didn't, I didn't want to say anything. I was like, I'll say it, I'll say it. <laughs> Very protective. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, as part of my my prep, I was reading uh, reviews of your store, uh, primarily on the Facebook page. They, I mean, really across the board, terrific. There was one one instance though, uh, <laughs> but where <laughs> you probably know the one that I'm talking probably. about. Yeah. Um, there was someone who uh, the sense that I got was he was a bit of a delinquent customer. Had you know not picked up books when he said he would. Mm -hmm. There also seemed to be an element of asking for a deal when it had been communicated to him that that was not on the table. Yeah. And are, are you the, actually sorry, are you the one who who responded to that? Uh, yeah. Because I, I was impressed by the response because it was, you. you know, it wasn't rude or anything, but it mm. was firm and it made your position clear. Thank you. Um, so, I mean, again, at least from what I saw on Facebook, it doesn't seem yeah. like you have to do that too often. But no, no. Um, and like I said, we're very fortunate that we don't get some of the like, really, like, what is like, what is up with you that you think like, what is up with you that you think that this is um, an appropriate way to communicate about your dissatisfaction? And uh that was a really frustrating one because he had been a problem for a long time. And it was one of the things where each of the staff members individually had been so personally frustrated with him. They were like, I don't, I just, I don't care. He's not worth our, our aggravation. And um, it's, it's important for me to respond in a non insightful way, but in an educative uh, educating way, like, and then when it comes down to people that say, oh, well, this is what happened, and I say this is what happened, there's there's nothing you can do there but reiterating that you told us when you would be in, and then you didn't come in, and that's not cool. Um, or no, we're not going to give you a sale price just because you came from Jersey. Um, so it's usually better off for everyone. And um, yeah, every once in a while, but that's... And we get a little we get a little pushback from our clubs once in a while too, but whatever. Like it's it's ladies' well, night, deal with it. We, like <laughs> no, no, it's like we want the place to be welcoming for everyone, but that means that someone's not going to be welcome, right? Because you can't, and and it's not going to be like if you can please eighty percent of the people, you're doing pretty good. And we want as many people as possible to feel comfortable to speak openly to have this be a safe place. But then you get the point where someone's if you comfort if, is infringing on someone else's comfort. Yeah. If you want to openly be a bigot in my store, no, that's not. It's not, <laughs> no. not going to happen. Like, no, and I'm not oppressing your feelings. You're you're being a bigot. <laughs> like, no, that's not. It's not how it works. Yeah, Titus had a really good response to somebody that was uh, very upset that we were um, promoting promoting Pro homosexuality and that we should think of the neighbors and the children in in the neighborhood. And uh, we should reconsider our ways. The, the agenda. Actually, Titus responded to that and just said, hey, this is an important part of who we are, our families, our employees, our customers. And if that's not okay with you, again, 
then you should be going somewhere else. Like, you're not going to change our minds. <laughs> that was actually something that I wanted to ask about, because I know that being inclusive is, you know, a big part of, of what you do here. And I think that's a very noble mission. But yeah, I was curious because, again, not everybody, unfortunately, is always receptive to that. So right. I was curious if you have encountered pushback like that. I mean, is that an isolated incident? Do you was, find that yeah. you're still on our Facebook, too? Um well, well, he he made a, a post uh, specifically about the LBGTQ book club that we have, um, which the reason why we have that is because the neighborhood and the community came in and said, <laughs> hey, can we have this thing? Um, so maybe he doesn't know who he's living next to. But um, yes, things like that are very few and far between. Uh, so no, we've actually gotten... Um, overwhelming positivity our queer club is one of our most attended groups um we have multiple pride displays and they all sell so fast i saw i saw uh, moon girl and devil dinosaur was one of them written yes. by my buddy brandon moncler he oh. was one of the owners of alternate realities no right. way for a brief period well huh. actually not that brief a period of time but this was before he got into uh, huh. writing and editing yeah. comics mm-hmm. yeah very cool, cool. yeah yeah, uh, and I'll tell you, man, that stuff sells so fast, uh, which means there's a need for it. And sometimes people will, su- will suggest certain things and say, hey, I really think that you should stock this, and that's how we end up getting it. And um, again, it's because people ask for something. I would have never ordered Smut Peddler. <laughs> just, just, but, based, just based on the name. Well, yeah. I, I didn't know that it was a thing because it's yeah. not my particular thing. But I order Smut Peddler, and lo and behold, day later, it's all gone. It's a thing people want. Far be it from me. And then you mentioned the ladies' night. So is this a matter of some male customers being upset that they are not included? <laughs> so, yeah. Um, the, the loudest one was probably the mom that was being mad for her. Remember that? Oh. Uh, I'm not really sure what happened with that exactly. Well, she waved at me last time I saw her at a convention, so. Okay. Uh, so we had, okay, again, we had one random response that said that ladies night was offensive to men and yeah, it she was, was, it was literally, it was a woman defending her son's right to come to this group, adult son who was like, mom, no, weird. Mom, no. <laughs> um, and so several, um, men responded that this is no, and, and my my so my my basic response to things like that are like, oh, there was an all Wonder Woman showing. Mm. Yeah, that's what well, I was thinking of when when this yeah. came up. So, wouldn't it be great though if we didn't have to have separate things because we didn't have a need for them? That's where Ladies Night and and it's now actually inclusive of non-binary people as well because, like anything else in our shop, we were inviting people to Ladies Night and some of them politely responded, "I don't offend, identify as female." And that that meant to me there's enough people that I need to be aware and inclusive of that, too. Um, so basically, yeah, basically it's a no dudes allowed. Why is that? Because guys don't have all of the other things that they experience that other people do. So my basic response is, wouldn't it be great if we didn't have to have one of those? Gosh, we, we would love that. <laughs> but because there are enough people that f- don't feel comfortable speaking openly with men around, um, or also just that we get into stuff that isn't really relevant to men. There's a lot of women's issues that maybe they don't want to hear us talk about. (laughs) And then you have people saying, well, if ladies night is a safe place for women, is the rest of the shop normally not a safe? No, Mm. no. This is just a specific time that we meet up and we talk about tampons and we talk (laughs) about whatever else. And there are plenty of other groups that, all genders go to. It's not like guys aren't hearing from women at other places. It's not like our half our staff isn't women. You know, it's not like there's an imbalance. You know, something that, that is often brought up with with groups that exclude a particular um, uh, group, which, you know, being married to a man and having many men on my uh, employees, they're aware that they're not part of this group and that And I'm aware that they could have some benefit to add. They could have different perspectives. Like if you have a problem with how one gender treats you, if you don't include that gender into the conversation, you're kind of missing something. So to, you know, kind of alleviate that, that's where we'll go back to our friends, boyfriends, whatever, and get their feedback and bring it back to the group and say, hey, so I went and I talked with these guys about their, you know, thoughts on this. 
Um, so we do try to be aware. On those instances where you do encounter pushback, do you find it's more on the Facebook group or online or, or do people are people saying these things to your face? Never in person. No. Yeah. It, it's always an email Figures. or on Facebook or on Twitter or whatever. No. Yeah. 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 I figured as much. Yep. <laughs> And even on Facebook, it's usually someone that says that they're a customer, but we don't recognize them. Like they, they, right. they might be a customer, but they're not like a, a, a weekly customer. They're not, you know. Like I, according to your profile picture, I know you have not been in the shop today. So. Like no one recognizes you. <laughs> <laughs> You're just some random person yelling at us on the internet. Fine. Have there been any groups or events that people have pitched, requested that you had to turn down? Yeah, there's one. I turn it down all the time. What's that? Like, D&D. Oh, yeah, D&D, yeah. All the time. Every, there's no place to play. Everybody wants to play somewhere. And that's something that breaks my heart because I get asked at least once a week. But with all the other stuff we do, there's not a fixed time that we can dedicate for someone else to come in and just have the room. Um, we always get requests for art classes and um, illustration guides and teaching things. Um, so we have guest creators for that from time to time. Um, and the libraries asked us to do some events there too. So we'll talk at a library. We'll go to a school for a little bit. But I think right now we're, we're pretty solid with the, with what we've got going on. So like I said, I, you know, I had the opportunity to look around the store for a good bit before we started recording. And um, like I said, I, I was really impressed. I was really struck by the the breadth and depth of, of merchandise um, because I, especially newer stores, I'm not really seeing that so much because again they are you know newer on the scene and they haven't yeah. had the time to build up so mm -hmm. you know the inventory that you guys have i mean obviously all the all the new stuff but again right. seeing the vintage toys seeing trade paperbacks that are not only the most recent trade paperbacks yeah. but seeing yeah. stuff that goes back a little bit mm -hmm. that really that really caught me um so that was great to see and then again just the variety the fact that we have of course you know our new books trades back issues statues toys supplies gaming um, I mean, again, it's, mm -hmm. you know, you guys really, you know, cover everything, yeah. you know, which is terrific. That inventory, is that, did you get that from the, the previous store? Has that been built up since then? Both? All of it. We're yeah. always buying collections. We're always buying stuff. I mean, a, a lot of, a lot of shops do that, you know, new this week sort of thing and really only carry stuff they can get through Diamond or, so you see like a lot of the same stuff in shops. And that, that was one of my things that I wanted to do was kind of have one of those, I, I want us to be a destination where we have a little bit of everything. Where you can find, you know, vintage Transformers and find like weird Golden Age comic books or or whatever. Um, so we're always trying to buy stuff, always trying to keep that stock out there, kind of fresh and uh, it's, it's always it's always turning around, always turning over. I, I definitely do not recommend opening a brand new shop uh, to people. Some people have done it successfully, but we've seen so many that have failed within three years because ordering comics, ordering new comics. It's, I can't, I can't, I it's, just yeah. daily, weekly, monthly, absolute nightmare. Um, so that in and of itself is difficult. And I do think it's because we have the range that we're able to su sustain. Um, there are some weeks when you get no comics or some weeks when they just all tank and nobody wants them or something, but we have enough, um, diversity. Um, we did buy as a turnkey. So we, we shut, it was one night it was the previous owners and the next day it was us. So everything just came part and parcel. And I also had a pretty large collection. So I kind of mm. smushed some of that in here too, to kind of help it out. But yeah. uh, unless you have people that have the knowledge, you can't do anything with that. So people that work here who have been customers here, he was a customer here first. We, we would come in and, and he would just kind of say, Hey, by the way, that's the wrong backpack with that GI Joe. Just so you know, <laughs> hey, just I just want to help because uh, people will do that. They'll say, hey, did you realize this shot up on eBay last night? And you know, help out. So he established his understanding and knowledge and started to work part time. I mean, when I was in high school, I drove up here to yeah, that was like a long time ago. Yeah. And then part time became full time. A long time customer. Yeah. Um, so em the employees have the knowledge which gets them hired, which enables us to keep buying the stuff. And uh, like every day, I'll explain to somebody that. No, we aren't going to be able to get the brand new Marvel Legends series that you can find at Toys R Us because that's the same price that we would pay for them. But I do happen to have all this vintage Star Wars stuff or the things that you can't find new. Right. Um, so we're kind of known in the tri-county areas being or tri-state areas being the place that you come to get rid of your stuff. And so everyone comes here. So we have a great selection. 
I want to touch on the, the buying process, but I have to say one thing in particular that caught my eye. Uh, I was a big fan of Spider-Man, the animated series on Fox growing yeah. up. Mm-hmm. And you do have that Daily Bugle playset. Yep. And I never had that as a kid. I had a, a lot. I had a ton of the toys from that line. And I had the Kingpin, like like the Kingpin headquarters or whatever. They did a okay. play set of that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I never had the Daily Bugle. It's mm. very tempting. Don't worry, Steph. <laughs> I, won't, uh, I, won't, I won't actually get it. But, uh, oh, man, it's cool to see. Yeah, definitely. Um, but so as far as buying collections, generally speaking, I mean, what sort of stuff are you really looking for? What do you, what do you tend to turn away? Sure. Um, with comics, it, it tends to be the older comics. Because at this point, we have so much of the newer stuff. Um, I, we we try to focus on the 60s, 70s, and before when it comes to buying. Um, I'll certainly buy other stuff too, but it really depends on what it is and if we need it. And that and that's that's a lot of where I come in. I kind of know what we have. I know what we need. I kind of know all of, that's that's where my my brain works good. Um, this is more like the the talky stuff is more uh, where Sarah's brain works good. I talk um, better. He I'm, thinks I'm, better. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm I'm more I'm more uh, uh, more data. I'm more like you know pure raw data. So yeah, I mean I I kind of know what we have. I kind of know what we need. Fluidity is a very important part of, of buying. Um, so if I'm you know buying comics, I, I'll certainly pay more for things that I know that we can basically move like quickly, like first appearances, you know, uh, key issues, that sort of thing. Same thing with toys. There's some toys that are just they're really easy to move, and you know I'll, I'll pay more for those, but I'll pay less for you know random filler stuff, you know. And a lot of that's just me kind of knowing what we have, what we need. The owner of the comic store where I worked, he loved when people would bring collections in, not so much to buy them, but he loved disabusing them of the notion that what they had was worth anything. He yeah. called it shattering dreams. Yeah. Yes. He really he really took delight in this. Uh, if you listen to the first season of the show, we, we yeah. do touch on it. Is, is there any element of enjoyment for you guys on, on that level? I, I don't really like <laughs> I don't really like breaking hearts, but it, it does happen frequently. So, I mean... it's it, I'm actually one of the it's, things that I was really um, I don't really admired enjoy it about about you and the crew when we first came on was the ability to tell somebody that your stuff isn't worth anything. Because and one of the things that you know was taught to me as a new owner was you don't want to tell people that their stuff is garbage. Nobody wants to hear that. We don't want them. Or if we can't buy something from someone, we don't want to just turn them away and say no, sorry, your stuff's terrible will suggest to them something else that they might be able to donate it or give it out for Halloween or give it to an art school to make into, you know, customize a, a box or something. So we try to give them something else positive to look for than just, oh, I have to take this home now. I get more enjoyment of seeing somebody delicately let somebody down. The the grace that which you can do it <laughs> or, or they come in and they say, I want $1,000 for this. And it's like, I'll give you $30 for this. And they're like, acceptable <laughs> what how did, th- how did you do that that's fantastic uh yeah we, we try to let them know that while there may still be uh excellent stories and great things to pass on they may not have a lot of monetary value which is different than value kids come and say what's your most valuable comic well let's see what does that mean to you what would you what what kind of value do you put on it and and i try to gently discourage people from buying for it to make money later. And I point and I say, see all those boxes for 25 cents over there? That's what happens when people do this. Just so you know, yeah. you're the problem. Um, doesn't stop them, but I try. I love yeah. that you guys do a graphic novel swap. Hey, thanks. Yeah. I think that's very smart. I'm sure you know there are other stores out there that do it. I think you guys are the first ones I've encountered where, where I've seen that. And it again, it makes a lot of sense to me. Do you find a lot of people taking advantage of that? Yes. Most definitely, yeah. Yeah, that actually was a customer suggestion um, because... Is that twice a year, once a year? Uh, sometimes. Sometimes. It's sometimes. usually whenever somebody says, <laughs> hey, are you, when are you going to have another graphic novel swap? But we do it. Usually there's one for kids or one for grownups or we have the table split so that There's a mix for everybody. Um, So we start off the pot with a bunch of stuff that we have. um, And then that way, whoever comes in first has choices. And whatever's left, we donate. Schools, libraries, hospitals. But it's really neat to see what comes back in. Sometimes it's really, really old stuff. Oftentimes, so we'll do it for a whole week. So people have plenty of time to come in. And since there are so many local regulars, they'll come in like every day. And the table will turn every day because people buy a bunch of stuff and then they'll read it and they'll bring it back and swap it out again um so it's really pretty cool that we get to see some old stuff it's like hey i forgot that existed we like it 
Yeah, thanks. Yeah, no, 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 that's very cool. Uh, something else that I, w- I was very impressed by, you know, going back to pet peeves, mm. not to be overly negative, but we, we used to drive us nuts when people would put stuff back on the shelf in the <laughs> wrong place. So I know mm. that you guys have your reshelf section, yeah. which is great. Do you, so has that just really cut down on the stuff? Great. That, yeah. Yeah. A lot of folks love it. I love it. So it's just a, a section. It's You have a, a short box top on a shelf where people put stuff back if they don't want it, and then you guys reshelve it. Yeah. Exactly. And like I use that myself throughout the day. I find something out of place and it's not time productive to put it away now. Chuck it in the box. And we do it in the kids section too. And with kids, they get the idea, like they understand that that's how you do it in a library. Um, and, and you know, you're talking to the kids, but you're looking up at the adult too. And they're like, yeah, I, I hear what you're saying. And that's just kind of part of the store tour when when folks come in that we can tell they're brand new or they um, haven't been to our shop before. We'll take them through the different parts of the you know, the, the focal points, there's dollar issues for the first issues for a buck, uh, first volumes for 10 bucks, staff picks, and here. And usually when that happens, we pick up something and throw it at them and say, this is a great thing that I really love. And then they have it in their hand. And they're like, well, I don't, I don't really, I don't really want this. Um, so we show them if you pick up something or if we thrust it at you unsolicited and you don't want it, just drop it over here. And, uh, Oftentimes they they'll pick it up or they'll pick up something out of the go back box yeah. and they'll be like, "Oh, I want to try this instead." I recommend it to everyone. Do it. Find a place to put them back. It's great. Yeah, no, I like that a lot. Uh well, I guess while we're on the note of pet peeves, any any pet peeves of yours in particular that you want to get off your chest? I know mm-hmm. delinquent customers, that's <laughs> I know yeah, that's a that's problem a that struggle. pretty much every store faces I'm to some sure degree or another. Qualifies as a pet peeve as much of that, a problem for existence. Yeah, it's like a potential business killer. Right? Yeah. That goes, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That goes um, beyond a pet peeve. Because I saw you just posted uh, just the other day, I think. Uh, sort. You what? No, no, yeah, no, can, I want to tell you about that. <laughs> Um, it was an explanation on Facebook about how right. the ordering system works and why it's so important that people do pick up their books. That, again, for any listeners who are, who are unfamiliar, comic shops are ordering their books in advance. You're laying out the money. You generally can't return things. Uh, and that when someone subscribes to a book on their pull list, you, you're saying, I, you know, please order me a copy. And then if they mm-hmm. don't pick that up, you know, you're, you're, the store's really out of luck. <laughs> yeah, yeah, basically. Um, so the funny thing about that is that Um, that's actually taken from um, part of the email that we send to our subscribers. So our policy is a month, and that's a pretty standard policy. Um, A lot of shops are super lenient. A lot are super, even stricter than we are. Um, Everything is different depending on each shop's needs and abilities. Um, And some some shops make you do like a cash deposit. So, you know, mm -hmm. they have some kind of backup to it. We don't do that. It's just, you know, we have a free subscription service. So... Free, free subscription plus perks. You get a free bag and board. You get a discount on back issues and key issues, um, early savings on sale days. Um, but I said, just sent this um, email to about 20 people saying, uh, hey, your bin is uh, still active, but you're going to be inactive soon. So it's been more than a month, but not quite two months. So friendly reminder, come on in. And then there was the other email that's, hey, it's been more than two months. If you don't come in within a week, we're going to have to shut your box and everyone's going to be sad then. So please just show up. Um, so I, I took that little bit about ordering in advance. You know, we can't make any money back from lost sales. And I put it on Facebook and somebody came in and said, hey, I'm here. I saw your message on Facebook. And I said, Bobby, we closed your box in December, dude. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, well, I know. I saw the emails. I said, you never responded to the emails. He's like, I know. I'm like, well, what it, What? Is, what even is that? Huh? So, uh, so I'm thinking now maybe we should take a social media uh, contact point. Like if you're checking Facebook more often than your email, maybe maybe that's the next step that we need to do to adapt and grow in the digital age. Yeah. I don't know. Or text. Um, text reminder yes, like so, like right. like what's your preferred method of contact like forget email because clearly that's not working right um although the f- the friendly reminder the before you've gotten on the on the on the next list um really works most of the people come in no questions they'll just like oh yeah it's been a while i come in um so it's it's usually good but the tough thing with delinquent subscribers when you haven't picked up after a month so we want to give you the benefit of the doubt and then we'll call you and wait for a response. And there's some people that just never come back, but some people that have been customers for years and they never come back or they never call. And those are the ones that hurt the most. Like some guy I don't really have like any investment in, 
it's not so hard if some no name is gone from your life. But when someone like, you know, they just got married, you know where their house is, you know what their job and dog look like. Like, that's what that's what's painful. But so we try to let them know, like, even if you can't come in, you're still welcome in the shop. Like, don't just not come back. Yeah, we, I mean, you know, delinquent customers, I mean, that was a huge problem at our store as well. And uh, if you believe the owner, that was a big reason why he ended up closing, uh, was that he got tired of of dealing with that. Don't doubt it. But there was a customer in particular we were very friendly with. He had us over to his house for barbecues. He was a big customer. He used to order and buy a lot. And then he just, you know, kind of disappeared and we never heard from him again. And it's, Mm. it is very disappointing. Yeah, it's, that's, that's, uh, just tell me, dude, just tell me. Just be like, yo, I can't make it. Don't leave me hanging. I mean, that the haggling is probably my my biggest pet peeve, and it's not even just the the reasonable ha- haggling is fine, but it's just like the the compulsive haggling, just to haggle type people that don't want to pay full price, no matter what the price is, even if it's you know already like marked down to like twenty five percent of what it should be. Um, those are the people that just kind of like, uh, I don't want to deal with you. Like, just go away. People I don't want to deal with. Uh, now that you've mentioned that. Um, <laughs> oh dear. No, just thinking like like what would be less than super awesome day. Um, people that ask questions but don't listen to your answers and mm-hmm. then ask you more questions while mm-hmm. you're answering the first one and they clearly just don't care. So then you have to realize that they don't care and maybe you don't need to be in this conversation. We get that at the law school too. It's yeah. great. I love when <laughs> someone calls and I'm trying to give them an answer and they just keep talking. It's like, what are you doing? We, we do have a bar right there, so that kind of, you get like the, the, the tipsy people that come in every once in a while that just start talking and not really paying attention, though. Like yeah. yeah. The bar is interesting uh, at the restaurant next door because uh, Friday and Saturday nights, it can either go really fun <laughs> where someone comes in and just buys a bunch of weird stuff and spends a lot of money and they're great, or it gets to the point where you're like, no, this is <laughs> this is not for you to just come be drunk in here right now. But usually it's... Yeah. It's usually okay. Uh, I have to say, as soon as I pulled in here, I mean, you really can't miss you guys. Uh, that sign. I did mean, you that's... find the way in here though? Like getting like once you turned in, but could you? Did you? Did you drive past us at first? No. Okay, good. Some people say they like we're set back from the road, so it's easy to drive past down the like down the marsh road. But once you turn oh. into the center, we're we're facing out. Yeah, yeah. No, no. Yeah. Didn't Good. have any issues. First awesome. first time here. So that was, uh, yeah, no, everything went well. Uh, but yeah, I mean, the sign, I mean, it's very prominent. Very, It's, you know, very comic booky. <laughs> um, yeah. How long have you guys had that? Um, the signage Since we put we... in when we moved here, which was five years ago, five years ago here, um, we were very fortunate that the uh, seven, original seven owners. Seven years as owners? Yeah. Okay. The original owners... Uh, Got us the domain name, thecomicbookshop.com. So it's uh, quite convenient for us, although also confusing when there's multiple stores that have a similar name. Um, we've gotten the wrong shipment sometimes because there's a the comic book shop in Spokane, Washington. Mm-hmm. Um, or someone's like, oh, you're the comic book shop. Which, where are you? We're, We're the comic book shop. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who's on first? Yeah. 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 I, was, I was actually <laughs> curious about the name. If you guys ever considered, you know, either when you bought the store or any time since, if you thought about changing the name to anything, yeah. you know. Yeah, I mean, if it was a, a different name, we probably would have changed it. But it's it's, I, you, we couldn't really change that name. I mean, having the domain name too, and it's having like we've been around for so long, we really couldn't change it. So, and it's a bad joke, so that's fun. Yeah, it's a comic book show. <laughs> Well, I mean, it, you know, it works because it's like, you know, most people, they have their regular store, right? It's like, oh, I'm going to the store. The com- I mean, for yeah. us, it was like yeah. always the store. Yeah. You know, here, I'll go to the comic book shop and that's your name. Yeah. So, I mean, it's it's appropriate. See, I make sure people realize that we are called the comic book shop because this is a place where you shop and you look. We're not a place where you buy like toilet paper and flour. You know, we're not like the general store where you right. get necessities. We're the shop where you go and look and you get inspired and there's all the cool stuff there. And you get personal recommendations, which I know is a big thing, right? Yeah. Unsolicited often. We do definitely have um, the the mission to be a place where everyone can come and be welcome how they are and we'll help you learn a little bit more um, if that's what you would like. We just, uh, you know, as many people as feel like they are not welcome somewhere, as many people feel like um, they don't belong, this is the place where 
no one belongs together, so we all belong. That's why we call this particular room. Um, so we're in a, a room next to the shop itself that we got actually after we'd already been here for a couple years and the space was still vacant. So this is our danger room. Um, also a community poll. Um, we had the, the Xavier Institute painted on the doors to come into our room. And uh, this is where, you know, it's where the X-Men learned how to be a team. It's where they learned how to uh, master their powers. And this is a room for everybody to explore and learn and be supportive of each other. I think what people should know for comic shops in general is just to talk with your shop, ask them what's up, go in regularly, um, place orders and pick them up. It's, it's, it's still really shocking how little people know about how the system works and how comics get made and that we order before we even know what's coming out. Well, you know, it's interesting as far as, I guess, educating customers, because when, when you and I were emailing about setting this up, you, and I appreciate this very much, you, you thanked me for helping people understand, yes. you know, essentially, you know, the retail side of this. And I, I've, I've enjoyed kind of peeling back the curtain a little bit um, on the retail industry. And hopefully listeners, you know, ha have been enjoying it and, and are enjoying yeah. it. Because I, I do think it's important for them to know. I mean, especially since so much of this industry is is community-based. I mm -hmm. mean, you know, what you guys are talking about here, I've heard this from other stores. I've seen it at other stores. I think it's it's great. And so I think, you know, if you are part of a community, you want it to be a strong community and you kind of want to know what's what's going on and how you can improve it. I mean, mm -hmm. again, I'm sure there are those who really have no interest in that and they just want to come and get their books when they want on their terms. And they don't care what your issues right. are right. getting it to them. Yeah. But I, I like to think there are enough customers who, who are invested in the success of a store and right. want to know things like this. Yeah. Yeah. There's there's definitely a. Uh, you know, in the past couple of years too, small business, shop local, uh, people are looking more towards people that they can go and see. Or, um, you know, November, December, we saw a lot of people coming in just to be somewhere, to not have to be at work, to not have to be at home. It's it is like your neighborhood bar, you know, bartender. Come come, tell me your problems. Come get it off your chest. This is a place where you can be away from all of that. You know, with these events, uh, so again, you know, obviously we talked about Teen Time and Kids Club mm -hmm. and uh, the LGBT yep. group, uh, book club generally. Yep. And just all these other events. Are you charging, is it like a cover price? That you, no. Nope. No. nope. Um, no, we don't charge for any of the events unless it's like a gaming event where you're buying the product to play, but we don't have a buy-in usually for those even. Um, no, and that's the, the neat thing about events is the book that we have that's... Uh, for that book club. So there, right now there's three book clubs a month, four if you count the last one. And those graphic novels are on sale for 25% off for the entire month, regardless of whether or not you come to the club. And we found that by having that structure, which may not work for every shop, we sell so many of those books because we're not limiting it just to the people that come to the club because that right. doesn't do a service to promoting the creators. And, um, yeah, I, I am, I'm regularly surprised by how many additional copies we sell to people off the street because it's featured. No, we actually do uh, donations involved with those groups, too. We uh, A couple times a year, the, the ladies group will bring in um, hygiene, uh, like feminine supplies, like um, tampons and stuff, uh, do clothing drives. Um, a lot of times we'll do like the book drives. But no, we don't charge for them. We just... And we don't need to because by virtue of having a place where people like to go and read a book, they're telling their friends. Right. They're coming back to buy a monthly. They're coming back to buy something else. So we, we want things to be as accessible as possible. And if you don't read the book and you don't have any money and you just show up to sit in the room quietly because you want to do that, that's fine too. Open. Yeah, yeah that's what I was curious about, the extent that you can parlay these events into, yeah. into sales for the store. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that makes a lot of sense. It's hard to quantify, but when you see the girl that reads the first volume for book club and then she wants to read the whole series and then every month she keeps doing that and wants to buy the whole series each time that's that's the size uh, kind of organic growth and that's um similar to like marketing we don't really spend money on marketing we have some phone book ads because you kind of have to have a phone book for people that don't you know, we, we still need the older people that aren't tech savvy because they have stuff that we want them to be able to find us. But we don't pay for anything else, really, because we found that advertising to people who don't care or might have a passing interest a little bit isn't as effective as 
here, take an extra copy and give it to your friend you were telling me about. Or, you know, that sort of thing that it's the people who have the interest are going to tell people who have the interest. And that's where it trickles in and comes from. Um, and that's that's the whole community. That's people bringing in their friends. It's, that's That's where it comes from. Well, congratulations to both of you for everything that you've built here. Thank you. Thank you. I wish you lots of luck moving forward. Uh, for listeners who want to follow you guys online, where should they go? Our website is thecomicbookshop.com. Um, on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook, too, you can find us at comicbookshop.de, as in Delaware. And, uh, yeah, we're in Wilmington. If you drive to Philly or Baltimore, you will pass our shop. So stop by and say hi. All right. Well, thank you both very much for being on My Comic Shop History. Thank you for thank having you. us. We look forward to hearing oh. the rest of them. Awesome. All right. To everyone who listened, thank you for tuning in. Uh, next week, it is an all-new episode of my other podcast series, Flat Squirrel Tales Beyond My Comic Shop. And My Comic Shop History will return in two weeks. Until then, don't be a flat squirrel. Flat Squirrel.